thanks, and, uh, and hello everyone. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, some colleagues from the university told me that a cool way to start would be to break into a Backstreet Boys routine with my head mic, but uh, I don't think I'll do that. All right. So about 10 years ago, the CBC had a mini-series uh, called The Greatest Canadian. And the objective of the, the exercise was to identify who the greatest Canadian of all time is. And uh, there was a process of public nominations where the public could nominate anyone, could nominate themselves that they wanted to. And then 10 finalists were selected. And the 10 finalists were then represented by celebrity advocates. And the ce celebrity advocates made the case for so-and-so being the greatest Canadian. And I'll just list some of the 10 finalists and I'll, I'll gauge from the nods in the audience whether you feel these should have been finalists. Pierre Trudeau, one of our greatest prime ministers, so some people are nodding, I see. Um, uh, Terry Fox, unfortunately a cancer victim, but uh, clearly a person who, who conquered cancer in many ways through what he did and the, the legacy of fundraising that he created. Um, David Suzuki, an educator, scientist, environmentalist, clearly a great Canadian that many people have learned tremendously from. Wayne Gretzky, whether you're an Edmonton Oilers fan or not, uh, clearly one of the greatest, I think the greatest Canadian hockey player to ever play, hockey player to, to ever play, and clearly part of the national identity, Hockey Canada, they go hand in hand. Don Sherry was chosen, that was a more controversial choice. And I, I hear that in your reaction. <laughs> the winner was Tommy Douglas. Tommy Douglas, I think that's actually kind of surprising. Why Tommy Douglas? Well, Tommy Douglas was the premier of Saskatchewan between 1944 and 1961. And he's also considered to be the father of Canadian Medicare. His selection as the greatest Canadian over all those names I listed shows you how health care is part of our national identity and how, despite imperfections, our health care system is a source of national pride. Now, if we look south of the border, if I were to ask you, is there any single policy of the Obama administration that is the subject of conversations around the, across the U.S., regardless of people's political stripes, left or right? Uh, I think most of you would agree that Obamacare would be right up there among the issues that people want to talk about. And that speaks to the fact that we as citizens, wherever we live, care about our health and we care about our health care. And so that's, that's a reality that I want to bring across as a first, as a first key point. The, the next point to make is that when we think about health and health care, we're anxious because we worry about our health. And when we read about our healthcare system being in trouble, that makes us anxious. And we actually often hear about quote unquote crisis. The healthcare system is in crisis. We hear this and you, you, even in the last week there have been headlines in our newspapers, local and national, saying there are health system crisis issues. And I want to take a little bit of time thinking about that crisis word. We hear this here in Canada. If you look south of the border, there's news coverage about the American system in crisis. If you look overseas, uh, in Europe, all healthcare systems have been described as being in crisis. In Asia, the, in China, in South Korea, in Thailand, in Mexico, you can Google healthcare crisis and a country, and you're going to get hits. So there is crisis in healthcare everywhere. That's what we're told. And if you think now, we're in 2014, if you look back to 2004, you Google healthcare crisis, there are stories about the healthcare system in crisis in the 2000s, in the 1990s, in the 1980s, and if you go back to the Tommy Douglas years, the whole thing about creating Medicare was because healthcare was in crisis. So we have crisis everywhere and always, this is what we're told. I want to take some time and break this down. So I went to Merriam-Webster to look at the word crisis. So crisis is a difficult or dangerous situation that needs serious attention. That definition speaks to crisis. And an alternative definition, an unstable or crucial time or state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending, 
especially one with the distinct possibility of a highly undesirable outcome. Good definition, and I think that speaks to what crisis is. And what I want to do here is speak to you as citizens who care about health and health care, as voters who vote in and vote out governments that have to answer to this crisis in health care, and also as patients who have to experience care with the nervousness that the system that you're in is in crisis. And I'm going to pose the question, are, are we really in crisis? And I want to take us through a, a bit of a more nuanced discussion about our health care systems to ask the question, do we have good health care? And I'm going to do that from a Canadian perspective, but speaking in generic terms that are relevant to systems anywhere. The Institute of Medicine, which is an American think tank focusing on, on issues of health and health care, has developed a definition of quality uh, that has six dimensions. And it's really a way of thinking of what the ingredients are, are for good health care. So for healthcare to be good, it must be effective, as a first point. And effective care involves the use of treatments and diagnostic tests that are known to be beneficial and the, the prevalent use of those, those things that are known to be beneficial. So care must be effective, first and foremost. Care must also be safe. So when we do things to patients, we can't harm them. And we have to make sure that our healthcare facilities and our information systems protect patients from harm brought, that can be brought to them from the system. The Institute of Medicine, in fact, did a study back in the 1990s estimating that every day in the United States there's the equivalent of a Boeing 747 crashing due to accidents or errors in healthcare. It's crazy. And here in Canada, we did a similar study suggesting that there are 20,000 preventable deaths in Canadian healthcare due to suboptimal safety. That does actually sound a little bit like a crisis. Back to the dimensions. For healthcare to be good, it must be timely. Waiting for healthcare is distressing, and at a minimum, waits cause emotional distress, but even in conditions like heart disease or cancer, delays in, in care or non-timely care can actually lead to death or, or bad outcomes for patients. So care needs to be timely. Care needs to be efficient and resource, resource protective. So we can't have waste in our system. Uh, unnecessary testing needs to be curtailed. Uh, expensive medications need to be replaced with equivalent alternatives that are priced better. Uh, a cost-efficient system is an element of, of quality. Care needs to be equitable. So a patient's ethnicity, their gender, where they live, their income, their education, none of those factors, in an ideal world anyways, should influence the care that they get. So care needs to be equitable. And last but not least, care needs to be patient-centered. And patient-centered care is really the core, I mentioned it last, but it's, it's kind of first and foremost. Care is about the patient, so care needs to be attentive to their emotional needs, their information needs, and patients need to be involved in decisions about their care. So those are the dimensions of quality up on a slide for you to think about. So just to, to drive this home, I'll just now compare the American and Canadian healthcare system a little bit to, to just bring out these dimensions and to, to bring in the notion of trade-offs. In the American healthcare system, there are considerable facilities and capacity, so care is timely. Weights are not often talked about in American healthcare. And care is effective. New beneficial treatments are quite swiftly adopted into care. Uh, that's perhaps at the expense of efficiency. Amer the American healthcare system is the most expensive healthcare system in the world, with 17% of gross domestic product going to, the, to delivery of healthcare. And it's also not a very equitable system with millions of uninsured or underinsured Americans. The Canadian system, meanwhile, is more equitable. And yes, it is more cost efficient. We have universal coverage that makes care somewhat more equitable, but it's much less timely. And those are the sorts of trade-offs that you have. And when you intervene to improve one dimension, you, you may compromise another dimension. So this is this notion of trade-offs. A few years back, a friend and colleague of mine, Stephen Lewis, uh, led a study with colleagues 
uh, here at the University of Calgary called the Americans in Canada study. And the objective of the study was to get the perspectives of dual system users who had, so to speak, test-driven the two systems, recognizing that the dual experience is a rich, a rich opportunity to learn from people who have had experiences in two systems. And, and many of you will remember the movie Sicko from a number of years ago, a Michael Moore movie uh, that painted a very, very rosy picture of the Canadian healthcare system that's probably too rosy, even though people want to feel that our system is great here in Canada. And we wanted a tidy answer. Oh, the Canadian system is awesome, or the Canadian system's not so great. But we actually got a very nuanced answer. The Americans who live in Canada told us that they embraced the notions of equity, they embraced the cost efficiency and the lack of out-of-pocket payments for their health care. But at the same time, they, they were really troubled by the lack of timely access to diagnostic testing, specialists, and so on. And those were the, the inverse of what they liked in the American system. So we wanted a crisp answer, and the answer we got from the Americans in Canada was, which system is better? It depends. So back to the question of crisis. Do we have crisis? Well, on the one hand, I could say, and I'm going to focus on Canada now, 20,000 preventable deaths due to lack of safety, waiting lists, distressed patients who aren't getting patient-centered care, um, rising health care costs, anxiety, anxiety, comparisons according to the Commonwealth Fund with European countries that aren't so flattering for Canada. We, we like to look south of the border and say, oh, our system's so equitable and good. But comparisons to European healthcare systems aren't so favorable for Canada. Those all speak to, yes, we do have potential crisis here. But then I can flip it around and say, another way of looking at it is to say that actually uh, life expectancy is greater now than it's ever been. Heart disease rates are lower care of hypertension, heart disease, stroke is better than it's ever been. Cancer survival rates are better than ever. There's been tremendous progress. There is a lot of innovation in our system. And for that, I want to point you to a book called The, uh, the Prescription for Excellence, written by Dr. Michael Rackless, who is a health policy analyst at the University of Toronto. And he has written about microsystems of excellence in the Canadian healthcare system where patients that good patient care is present, efficient protocols for streamlining patients through clinics are in place. And he speaks of needing to multiply this excellence throughout the system. We hear from the Canadian Institute for Health Information that there's also a leveling off of spending now with, with a slight uh, reduction in the worrisome trends of spending on health care. And innovation is at the core of this enhancement. Uh, continuing along that same line, I want to draw your attention to a book by Matt Ridley called The Rational Optimist, and this came out about two years ago. It's not called The Pathologic Optimist, it's The Rational Optimist. And I actually embrace these notions, and some people tell me I'm, I'm way too optimistic about things like my favorite hockey team winning the Stanley Cup every year. Uh, and I don't disclose that here in front of a mixed crowd. <laughs> but. Um, the, the, the notion of the rational optimist is that life expectancy is greater than ever, and economic prosperity on a global scale is better than it's ever been. Countries have had large proportions of their, their people move above the poverty line. And the foundation of this progression of humankind over centuries has been specialization, collaboration, cooperation, and technologically-based innovation. Innovation leads to advancement of humankind through the centuries. So back to healthcare and back to my fundamental question. Are we in perpetual crisis? Or are we perhaps more in perpetual challenge? And the challenges are, relating to this slide again, care that needs to be safer, care that isn't timely enough, care that isn't efficient enough, care that isn't equitable enough, care that isn't sufficiently patient-centered. I think those are the challenges. And I don't think we should throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, crisis, it's impossible. 
I don't think that's constructive. We have challenge, but we also have the ability of humankind to innovate and innovate and innovate. We've done it for centuries. We can continue to do it. It's all about trade-offs. A, a system that's more timely may become less efficient. It might cost more. A system that's more equitable might become less timely because equitable care might make it difficult to get the wealthy to get their surgery in one day. Those are the trade-offs that we need to make as, as humankind, as societies. And just really in closing, I'll say, I've brought these ideas forward to try to give you nuanced thinking around healthcare, to make you think as, again, the citizens who care about these issues, the voters who vote in and out, the governments that have to decide on these issues, and ultimately the patients who receive care in the system, I wanted to share these thoughts with you. Do we have crisis in healthcare? I say crisis schmisis. Thank you. Thank you.